TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. Some people complain that me and AP always go live at like 8 o'clock and they say that's too late for Europe, but we're a little earlier now for some of you European viewers who need something to look forward to given that you live on that terrible continent. Uh, so we've got this show for you. And I'm with Louis Dizon. And Louis, I was on your one, I guess your co host of that show, uh, Reason and Theology. Yes, Reason back. and Theology. Although uh, right now we're going through a rebranding process. It's now going to be called the Michael Lofton Show. Um, but yes, uh, you're I'm not, frequently. You're not Michael there. Lofton. I'm not. I am just his left hand man. Left hand because I'm lefty. Uh, but don't tell the Salafis that, or else, you know, they might not let me uh, into their mosques anymore. Um, anywho, yeah, I'm frequently on there and I discuss a wide variety of issues, mostly on uh, biblical studies and comparative religions. I do a fair bit of Islam related broadcasts on there because that's something of a forte of mine. Mm -hmm. And so I was over there with you and that was in a discussion I was having. That was for a discussion I was having with uh, Dr. Khalil Andani. And I think we were talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, but I have been getting messages because I'm on the academia, academia.edu mailing list. And basically once they find out what sorts of topics that you're interested in. They'll send you papers on those topics. And one that they've been sending me recently is titled Variations in the Consonantal Text of Quranic Manuscripts from Uthman to Ibn Mujahid by you. Yes, that is a paper that I wrote a few years ago. Uh, for one of my PhD seminars. So my PhD supervisor, Dr. Walid Saleh, he does Quranic studies at the University of Toronto. And one of the things that I had to do for the seminar is to do a research paper on some area of Quranic critical studies. And I chose to do mine on textual criticism of the Quran. And you've actually been dealing with Islam for a while at, at an at a, uh, I guess, an academic level. I, I saw at you. At an academic level, yes. I've seen um, you interacting on, especially, what matter of fact, one of the topics, probably like to have you on again at some point, um, is uh, the Muslim view of the previous scriptures. And I saw uh, yes. you, I don't even remember where I was, where I was watching this at, but I saw you talking about uh, that you have the view now where it's the corrupt, the, the text has been corrupted. But if you go back to the, the earliest uh, commentators, it was that people were corrupting it with their speech. And then I think later on it became they were corrupting it with their speech and corrupting the text. And then it just became their mainly their they're corrupting the text. It was, so, was something like that. That was a long time ago. Yeah, I've done a lot of research on that topic over the years. Actually, it forms part of my dissertation research as well, because I'm looking at uh, Muslim writers who use the Bible in their writings uh, to see how they interact with the text. And part of that involves tracing the history of uh, Muslim attitudes towards the Bible. Uh, and one of the things that uh, there's a general consensus on, although there's the occasional dissenter from this view, is that uh, a lot, most of the early Muslim writers who uh, discuss the Jewish and Christian scriptures regard it as basically accurate, albeit misinterpreted by those who possess them. It's really in the 10th century where a shift occurs and they start seeing uh, the Jewish and Christian scriptures more in terms of textual corruption. And that would be, that would make sense. It would make sense that in an early community where people don't know much about what's in the Bible, mm -hmm. that based on the Quran, they would conclude that the Bible is a, is a good, solid revelation from Allah. Yeah. And then later, once they're interacting more and more with people who are pointing out what's in the Bible, that uh, they have to change their narrative because that, that one's not going to work anymore. 
that's part of it. I, I think that might be a little bit uh, oversimplistic because there were some Muslim polemicists in the 8th and 9th centuries who were quoting the Bible and trying to use it to prove Muslim beliefs. Uh, people such as Ibn Rabban, who was a former Nestorian Christian who converted to Christianity. He wrote an early polemical text trying to prove um, Islam from the Bible. And he he's actually responsible for a lot of the proof texts that Muslims use to this very day. Uh, stuff like Isaiah 29, mm-hmm. um, the Paraclete passage in John 14 to 16, etc. Like he came up with a lot of those. But even he uh, at that point did not argue for the corruption of the Bible. When he quoted from the Bible, he basically assumed it was accurate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it is, it, it is, uh, it's interesting when people have a view today and they think that has always been the view and it mm-hmm. doesn't actually doesn't actually line up with their earlier guys. All right, so we're going to go through uh, your presentation. Guys, I'm just sort of going to let um, Lewis give a presentation because I uh, I asked him to present the contents of his academic paper. So he's gonna take over and just give a, a presentation and a run through uh, of the situation. So yeah, we'll have to see if I can pull this up. I did have one question before we get started, uh, Lewis. Sure. The, you have a couple of different narratives. Um, so, so one is the popular level Muslim narrative, which was told to them by their leaders and their scholars. Uh, people like Sheikh Yasser Qadi have told Muslims that since the time of Uthman, there have not been any two Qurans that differ in even one letter, not one letter's difference. Mm -hmm. And you have, uh, that that has been the standard Muslim view for the past couple decades is perfect. I have Muslim apologetics books using this as an argument that it has to be miraculous. They're saying not one letter, not one diacritical mark, not anything is different between any two Quran, any two copied Qurans from the time of Uthman down to the present. And they basically say human beings make errors. So if no Quran copyist has ever made a single error, this has to be miraculous. So just a quick question, since you're looking at things at the academic level, at the academic level, so scholars and so on, scholarly books, scholarly articles, uh, scholarly conferences and so on. How popular is the view that there is only one Quran, that it is completely identical to every other copy of the Quran, and there are no variances, not even in one single letter between any two copies of the Quran? How well is that being defended at the academic level? How popular is it? Yeah, that sort of viewpoint, while I know some popular level preachers who espouse it, uh, at an academic level, I don't know anyone who holds that view. Even the most conservative Muslims uh, that I know who are engaging with textual criticism at an academic level have to acknowledge at some level that variations exist. Uh, They may differ over the extent of that variation. Uh, Some might say that, oh, it's relatively minor. Uh, for example, we'll say, oh, it's a little more serious than that. But on the whole, everyone is on the same page that uh, there is variation among manuscripts of the Quran. And uh, those aren't simple, you know, simple matters of oh, different vowel markings and stuff like that. Uh, there are differences in um, the diacritics and there are differences in even the consonantal text, the actual uh, skeleton of the the text, which is, of course, the premise behind the title of my presentation, Variations in the Constantial Text of Quranic Manuscripts. So if you want, I can mm-hmm. go over the evidence yep. and what they present. All uh, right. So let me go ahead and get your uh, mm-hmm. presentation up. Uh, Rockstar here said, David, come on, man. The Quran is perfectly preserved in oral tradition. That's a standard one we get, even though, you know, people in Morocco, they're going to be orally reciting. The uh, Warsh Quran, not the Hafs Quran. So you get the differences even at the uh, level of oral recitation. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Is my um, PowerPoint yeah, let me visible? Uh, not yet. Let me 
we should have practiced this right beforehand. I know how to do it. It's just I'm not used to doing it much with the share screen. And there we go. All right. So this is the working title of my paper, Variations in the Continental Text of Quranic Manuscripts from Uthman to Ibn Mujahid. So uh, the basic thesis of what I'm going to be presenting is already there. Uh, and as academic papers go, I try to be precise in what exactly I am talking about. So we're talking about variations, but they're variations specifically in the consonantal text. Uh, so these are a little bit more than just uh, vowels or even diacritics. Um, it's a little complicated to explain all this stuff to someone who doesn't know the Arabic language. Uh, so I'm going to have to explain some features of Arabic um, uh, orthography as we go along. But first of all, I want to talk about what I am not going to be arguing for in this presentation. So I am not arguing that the problems in the textual transmission of the Quran render all interpretations of Islam false. So obviously Islam is a very um, multifaceted religion. There are all sorts of different viewpoints. You've got uh, really conservative uh, fundamentalist, even uh, Salafi oriented groups. Uh, you've got more uh, modernist or liberal strands within Sunni Islam. And then you have the non-Sunni groups like the 12 Rishis, Ismaili Shis, all of whom will approach this topic a little bit differently. So it's hard to say that uh, a presentation like this would uh, be problematic for Islam and Toto. Maybe some interpretations of Islam, but not all of them. Uh, nor am I going to argue that these problems are so immense that they render it impossible to know the text of the Quran. Uh, it's really hard to make dogmatic statements like that. Uh, the most that we could really say is that it is difficult to know uh, what the text might have been at certain points. And it's also hard to judge uh, to what extent variations may have occurred uh, in pre uthmanic times. So I'm going to uh, stick to the more modest uh, thesis that uh, the Quran has significant has significant textual variation in it, uh, more significant than uh, a lot of conservative Sunni Muslim scholars and apologists are willing to uh, admit to, and that uh, this continued to be the case even after the Uthmanic standardization. Uh, you know, hey, uh, uh, Lewis. Uh, Yes. Uh, you know, up on the screen there, you have what you're not arguing. And you say you're not arguing that uh, problems in the textual transmission of the Quran render all interpretations of Islam false. And you're not arguing that these problems are, are so big that we can't know what the text of the Quran is. And what's interesting is if you're if you're reading, if you're reading those things that you just said as a Christian, mm -hmm. you're thinking, of course. Why? Why would you think that if a copyist mm -hmm. makes a mistake that this means that you know Islam is false? Right. Or why would you think that um, that having textual variance makes it impossible to know what the the real reading is? Uh, so, so, from our perspective, of course, of course, arguing that there are textual variants doesn't mean you're arguing any of these other things. But that's how lots of Muslims argue when it comes to the Bible. They'll say, "Ah, there's a textual variant, therefore." You can't know what the Bible says, or you can't get back to the original, or if you've got if you've got different Bibles that have textual variants, therefore you have all these different Bibles, and we can't know what is what, and this just shows that Christianity is false and corrupted. So it's funny because I'm reading this like like why are you even putting this up here? Obviously, we wouldn't conclude that Islam is false just because of textual variants. When from the perspective of Muslim apologists, that's exactly how they argue about the Bible. There are textual variants, therefore Christianity is false. Yeah, so that's part of why I'm saying this. People, oh, I, I also want to make sure that people don't think that, oh, I'm doing this to disprove, quote, unquote, Islam. Uh, if I wanted to disprove, uh, quote, unquote, Islam, uh, this would not be the track that I would go. This is mainly uh, so that I can show that when Muslims do use textual criticism to attack the Bible, a lot of the times they're engaging in a double standard. Mm hmm yeah. And I will admit there are problems in textual transmission as well for the Old and New Testaments, especially Old Testament. Um, I do some study of 
Old Testament textual criticism and sometimes the issues there like Septuagint versus Masoretic text can give me a little bit of a headache. Uh, but of, I don't think that that is something that mitigates uh, from my view that this is divinely inspired. Mm -hmm. In the same way, you know, uh, I'm willing to concede that maybe it's possible that the Quran is the word of God despite the problems in its transmission. Uh, so my not believing in it is due to other reasons. Mm -hmm. All right, proceed. All right. So first we need to look at how um, this study came about. So uh, I'm, I'm obviously not uh, inventing something new. Chronic textual criticism has been around for a while now. And um, uh, it has been done at a scholarly level since at least as far back as the mid 19th century. So uh, one of the groundbreaking works on this topic was uh, the work by Theodore Noldecke, uh, Friedrich Schwally, Gotthilf Bergtracer, and Otto Pretzel, all uh, solid German names, in the uh, Geschichte des Korans, which has fortunately been translated into English as the History of the Quran, um, published by Brill. Now, this book was uh, published in 1860 in the original German, but it speaks to the um, uh, resilience and the erudition of its authors that to this day, this work is still being cited and translated into other languages. So anyone who is doing a study uh, of Quranic textual criticism ought to know the work of Noldeka et al. A now, little what, bit now, now if, if we were to open that book, is, uh, is he going to say that, uh, that the Quran was revealed to Muhammad, his followers copied it down, and then it was perfectly preserved from that time down to the present? Well, no, they wouldn't. They uh -oh, actually, a lot of, um, they're quite critical in their approach, as was the case uh, with most 19th century um, works on religion published by Germans. Yeah, Germans. Um, you got to watch out for those Germans. I know. Um, it's funny because um, a lot of Muslims like to use 19th century uh, higher criticism against the Bible. Uh, they would cite, for example, Ju uh, Wellhausen and Graf and their documentary hypothesis. But the exact same people uh, were uh, publishing similar works on the Quran, uh, which this book is a prime example of. Uh, now, this stuff has uh, trickled down into English over time, uh, you know, and there have been some English speaking authors that have published some uh, similar material. So one of the main works in the early 19th century, sorry, early 20th century on this topic uh, is Arthur Jeffrey's book, Materials for the History of the Text of the Quran, uh, also published by Brill. Uh, and um, when the nice thing about this is that most of the book is just a um, showing of the variant various, sorry, the various variants in the companion codices. I will explain a little bit further down uh, this presentation, what the companion codices are, uh, but they use works like the Kitab al-Masahif of Ibn Abi Dawud, as well as various other um, early Muslim works on um, Kira'at. So, you know, there's a whole genre of Muslim literature called the Kira'at literature, and what Jeffrey does is he takes this literature and summarizes it um, for an English-speaking audience. And that's what this is. It is available on archive.org, so you can get a copy of it for free. But uh, it is pretty Arabic-dense, so you may want to have a, at least knowledge of the Arabic alphabet to be able to really make use of this work. And then the more contemporary critical work on chronic uh, studies started with a man by name John Wansbro um, in his book Chronic Studies in 1970. One of his uh, main uh, theses, which has proved to be controversial uh, to this day, was the idea that uh, the standardization of, of, of the Quran didn't actually happen during the time of Uthman. That was just a later tradition that was back projected onto the first century. Uh, Wandsboro took the view that the uh, the uh, standardization of the Quran took place later, like in the uh, century after uh, Muhammad. Now that thesis has proved to be uh, a little bit of a contested issue. There are some 
uh, er writers such as Andrew Rippin, um, who have continued to promote this view, but a lot of uh, other scholars disagree and think that uh, the more traditional view that it happened during Othman's time uh, was correct after all. Um, so you think I think of people like Nikolai Sinai, uh, or more recently someone like Marine Van Putin, who would take a more conservative "quote unquote" view uh, and say that well, it did happen during Othman's time, just like the Muslim sources claim. But there is that school of thought known as the revisionist school, which started with Wandsboro, that think it took place later. Uh, I am not taking a stance for or against the revisionist theory. I just want to highlight that as something that exists out there in academia. Now, we'll go to more contemporary works on chronic textual criticism, and I'll begin with the more basic works. These are the books that you'll want to have in your library if you want to embark on a study of this. So the very first thing that I would uh, recommend people read is uh, a book by Francois de Roche uh, named The Voice in the Quill originally published in French as Le Voix et le Calan. Actually, uh, most of uh, Dr. Desroches' work was originally published in French. And if you read the uh, original paper that I based this presentation on, I cite all of Desroches' works in the original French because I didn't have access to English translations at the time. Um, Fortunately, now they have all been translated to English, so the reader can look at the English editions. Uh, a slightly longer uh, book that he wrote is The One and the Many, originally published in French as uh, Le Coran en Histoire Pluriel. Uh, and this is, uh, the nice thing about this is it's basically a summary of the current state of Quranic textual uh, criticism. So if anyone wants to know uh, where we currently stand on chronic textual criticism, uh, I would say begin with these two books. A third book, which is slightly more advanced, but still within the basic category, is Daniel Allen Brubaker, uh, Corrections in Early Quran Manuscripts. Uh, now, what Brubaker does in this short little work, which is also um, part of his PhD research, if I recall correctly, is he goes through photographs of various Quranic manuscripts that where certain parts of the text have been taped over or covered over or written over to show how sometimes the copyist uh, will dislike how the manuscript in front of him reads. So he will remove the offending text and put in what he regards as the correct text. Now, majority of the readings that Brubaker uh, records and photographs in his book are readings where the original text uh, deviated from the 1924 Cairo edition. Uh, but on very rare occasions, the, the correction will actually go in the other way, like it will take the canonical um, reading as attested to in the Cairo edition and provide a reading away from it. But that's the exception rather than the rule. So these are the three books that I recommend uh, people get first. And uh, you want, Daniel, yes. Daniel Brubaker also has a YouTube channel where he'll show pages of the Quran and show variants on them. Uh, it's interesting. He made a, a short video once where he showed one, one page of a copy of an old Quran. And he pointed out I think it was 11 textual variants, so 11 variants that do not line up with the uh, standard Hafskaran of today. It was all on one page. What, what's interesting is that once people have bought into uh, like a myth about perfect preservation and no variants, they, uh, I, I've, I've, seen, I've seen them respond. I've seen people respond in comments saying things like, you wrote that yourself. <laughs> like. Um, he, yeah. he, he made that page of the Quran himself as the as if the only explanation for uh, for variance on a page of the Quran uh, is someone uh, someone someone making a false a false copy. What, what the other thing that's interesting about this is that you're you're talking about these books that are about textual criticism of Quran manuscripts. But yeah. you could walk into pretty much any Christian bookstore and find books on textual criticism of the Bible, and you can open up almost any 
almost every Bible I had, unless it's just like a, a, a Gideon's Bible where they just stick with the text, uh, almost every Bible I have has notes on textual criticism. So they explain to yeah. you as you're reading, they explain, hey, there, there is a variant in this in this verse that says this. Uh, and so it's a, I don't know. It's just interesting. It's like the the criticism has to come from without at this point in history the criticism has to come from without so, come from outside of islam rather than from within even though historically there were muslims who were who were doing textual uh, criticism and comparing things uh, but yeah go ahead yeah so there are some muslims who are engaged in this work but it seems that a lot of the um uh main players as you can call them in the field at this point appear to be non-muslims like as far I'm, I don't know that Francois de Roche is a Muslim. As far as I know, he isn't. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that. Now, there are a few people uh, who, who are Muslim who have done work on this. So uh, actually, before I mention uh, that, I also want to mention um, Keith Small's Textual Criticism in Quran Manuscripts. So that is another book that talks about various... Um, uh, various uh, variations that happen in some of the early um, codices that we have, like the copy manuscript, the Tashkent manuscript, etc. And he provides some uh, photographs of this, them as well. It's less photograph heavy and more text heavy. And this is the beginning of uh, more advanced discussions on Quranic textual criticism. I would not recommend readers read any of these books until they've gotten a good um, working knowledge of the Arabic language first, and also have read the more basic level materials first. Uh, so Keith Small provides some of that information. Another book that I uh, also highly recommend is this. So this is Shadi Hikmat Nasser, oh, the translation. We, we, yes. cannot, we cannot see you, but it's already on your screen. We're only looking at your PowerPoint. Okay, okay, fair. So, um, it's the book that's on the screen. So the mm -hmm. transmission of the variant readings of the Quran by Shadi Hikmat Nasser. So this guy is Muslim, as far as I know. Uh, how devout is he as a Muslim? I don't know. Uh, when it comes to academia, it's hard to tell the level of devotion of a lot of people who identify as Muslim these days. But he does a very interesting study of what are known as the Shawav readings, or Shav in the singular. Shav is basically the Arabic uh, word for abnormal or anomalous. So these are um, readings that don't correspond to the canonical seven that Ibn Mujahid uh, canonized. And he talks about uh, what these types of variants look like and what they mean for the uh, transmission of the Quran, especially when it comes to the idea of tawatr, uh, which is basically the idea that uh, you can't really doubt the uh, transmission of something because it's so well attested and the uh, transmission chains are so um, impeccable. I'll talk about that a little bit further down the road. And then Francois de Roche, again, he has a more, um, a slightly more advanced work than the two that I just mentioned. It's called Qurans of the Umayyads, a preliminary overview. So again, this is a study of the various manuscripts that were known up to that point. And again, this is much more detailed than the aforementioned works. So it gets into some minutia of Arabic, of like the orthography of the manuscripts. So if you like minutia, these are the books that I would recommend getting. Uh, now, before we continue, there are some key terms that we need to explain because these uh, terms are going to come up quite a bit in our discussion. The three terms that you need to know are rasm, kira'a, and harf. So rasm is, you know, broadly speaking, it means writing. Uh, and when we use rasm in the context of Quranic textual criticism, it generally refers to the consonantal text of the Quran. So this consonantal text comprises the basic skeleton of the uh, Arabic script. And that resum will then be overlaid by uh, various diacritics and vowel markers. So the once you add that in, you have what we can refer to as a qira'a. So qira'a uh, comes from the verb qara, which means to read. 
And so what, 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 one second, uh, one second, Lewis. So just for people to have an idea of what you're talking about here. So if we just look at the word kira'at there, um, yes. we see some text and then we see some dots. So as far as the yes. rasam, that would be that would be the text without the dots. Is, is, is uh, so it's a little complicated because there's two levels of um, marking on the Arabic script. So, yes, if you take a look at the Arabic words that are on the screen, uh, there are some diacritics on them. So the letter Qaf has two dots on top of it. The Tamabuta has two dots on it. The letter Fa has one dot on top of it. Uh, so those are the diacritical markers, and they're used in the Arabic language to distinguish certain letters from each other. Um, so, for example, the little circle with two dots is the letter Qaf, which makes the Q sound. Uh, you have to make it from the back of your throat, and uh, it's for some people that's not easy to do. That's contrasted with the letter fa, which if you look at the word for harf, it's the same little circle, but there's only one dot on top of it. Uh, in some really early manuscripts of the Quran, there were no dots. So you had to know what you were looking at to tell the difference between qaf and fa. Uh, otherwise, you would get lost. Yeah, uh, so, so, the, so the idea there is... Um... We're not entirely familiar with how this goes. We are familiar with uh, with having to know rules of uh, pronunciation, mm -hmm. and y you can. So you anyway. Point is, you could take a word like "are," like you That's are hard. going to the store. A R E. If you went with the normal rules of pronunciation, that would look like "air" because you've got an "e" on the end, so it would it would look like yeah. "air." But "air" is spelled "a i r" and so on. So you can only know what's being said by being familiar with the language but uh so i guess the idea is since since the dots over over or under some of these letters determine which letter it is if you didn't have the dots seems like you would usually be able to figure out what's being said from context um or, or like, yeah yeah i know yeah. not not always so so it's like a i mean imagine if i said i want to go to the missing letter a r Right. So uh -huh. uh, and, and suppose the possibilities, because a letter could be could be something else. In other words, if the first letter of that last A.R. word like car or bar or tar or something like mm -hmm. that uh, was yeah. ambiguous and I didn't know which one it was. Well, some some readings of that sentence wouldn't make sense. Like I want to go to the far. It wouldn't make any yes. sense. It wouldn't sound weird. But there could be situations where I want to go to the tar or I want to go to the car where those would make yeah. sense. And you'd kind of look at context. So it looks like you could usually figure it out what what's being talked about. Like if I just talked yeah. about a car, uh, you know, two verses earlier or something like that. But it looks like at certain times there there will be occasions where two different letters make complete sense in a verse. Yeah. Um, that is generally the case. So your analogy, it's not a perfect one, but it's in the general direction of why these uh, consonant, these consonantal diacritics uh, exist. Actually, uh, I think it, I heard this from Ben Putin. He had a very humorous example of what you can do with the text if you completely ignore uh, the tradition of diacritics. So in Surat al-Baqarah, the uh, first verse after the three letters says al -kitab la fihi, which in English you would translate as that is the book in there there is no doubt as uh, Van Putin has uh, very humorously observed uh, you can actually play around with the dots and render that first verse as al -kabab la fihi. this is the kebab in it there is no oil <laughs> nice so, and, that, and that's, ju that's just by changing the dots and so on that's just changing the dots. That's right. Now, no, but, but by the way, um, by the way, uh, Lewis, uh, uh, Puin famously said that on average, every fifth verse or so of the Quran is completely un, uh, incomprehensible. Is, is that what he's is that what he's talking? I don't know if you know what he's talking about right there, but because I've, I've brought that up to Muslims and they'll say, what are you talking about? It's not incomprehensible. It's what we're talking about. I, I've, yeah. I've, I've been wondering, was he talking about something like. Well, if you go to the earliest manuscripts and you don't have the dots, you're going to get some incomprehensible verses or is he, or is he saying like even now it's it's incomprehensible? 
I don't remember the original context he made that comment in, so I would have to see when he said it uh, to figure out what exactly he meant by that. Um, yeah, I've, 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 I've always wondered. So, yeah, maybe we'll look hmm. that up and see if we can figure maybe it out. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that a lot of Quran verses, if you were reading it without the benefit of, you know, the uh, Asbaba Nuzul, uh, the occasions of revelation or other or tafsir, uh, you wouldn't know what was the context, why this thing was said to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a completely different topic from yeah. textual criticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, Rasam Kira'a Harf. Yeah. So, the Kira'a actually it includes the diacritics. It also includes what are known as vowel markers. So, I don't have vowel markers on the Arabic words that we have here. In Arabic, we have three. They're the Fatha, the Kasra, and the Dhamma. And they're used to indicate the A, U, and I vowels uh, because, you know, classical Arabic is an unvoweled text. Uh, long vowels will sometimes be indicated with letters like Alif, Waw, and Ya. Uh, but the short vowels are not. So when we talk about kira'a, we mean like the complete, fully vocalized text with the diacritics and those vowel markers on them uh, so that you know exactly how to pronounce every syllable of the text. Um, so so now, ju just, just to be clear, just to be clear, because this will be new for a lot of people and I'm a little shaky on it as well. So the if you were to go to certain early manuscripts and you didn't find the necessary dots, the claim is that mm -hmm. you wouldn't know how to pronounce certain things. But then once you get to the uh, to the Kira, then you've got all the necessary markings and anyone who knows Arabic could then pronounce it correctly. Yeah, more or less. Now, obviously, you know, uh, some parts of the Quran without the benefit of these aids are easier to discern than others. Uh, but on the whole, you do need these diacritics and the vowel markers to make full sense of the text. Now, this is where we get to the third um, term, which is harf. And in Arabic, the word little means letter. So we refer to um, the letters of the alphabet as the huruf. And that word becomes used in some of the hadiths uh, regarding the recitation of the Quran to refer to uh, different ways of reciting the text. And this becomes one of the most enigmatic terms uh, that appear in the hadith tradition because we have all these hadiths where um, it says that Muhammad recited the Quran in sabat ahruf or seven letters. Uh, what exactly does that mean? We're not entirely sure. There's uh, a lot of uh, popular writing that claims that this refers to different dialects of Arabic, uh, but I'm not convinced that this is the case. As Francois de Roche pointed out in The One and the Many, you actually had instances where two people who spoke the same dialect uh, recited a different harf. Uh, so it, you can't uh, explain these in terms of, of dialects. Another note is that the word dialect in a lot of the hadiths, when they do refer to dialects, they use a different word. They use lisan, which in Arabic literally means tongue, but can also be used to refer to language. Um, so the fact that they use a different word to designate dialects in the hadiths uh, would seem to indicate that when the word harf is used, uh, it's probably not a dialect. So to illustrate what I am referring to, here's a sample of Quranic text. So this is, of course, Surat al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-Din iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihtina sirat al-Mustaqim, sirat al-Adina an'amta. So, you know, most well-known pastor of the Quran, Muslims recite it during all their Salat prayers. And it's easy to recite it because, as you can see, all of the diacritics and the vocalizations are right there. So even if you never read Surat al-Fatiha before, as long as you know um, Arabic orthography, including the uh, Fatah, the Dat, Dhamma, the Kasra, etc., you could sound out these words. Now, 
this is where we get start getting into the problems of Quran transmission. So I'm going to quote from a scholar named David Stewart in his article, Notes on Medieval and Modern Emendations of the Quran. So people have assumed, well, uh, conservative Muslim apologists have assumed that the written transmission of the Quran is guaranteed by the oral transmission as well. So that, you know, how many times have you heard this claim, right? Uh, oh, even if Thousands. you burn every single manuscript of the Quran, you can reproduce the whole text just from people's oral memories. Thousands. Well, I've heard that thousands. Yeah. Of times. <laughs> yeah. So it's not quite that simple. So let me quote what uh, Stuart says here. The Quran is open to the same types of copious errors and problems of transmission that occur in other works handed down by humans, including sacred texts. The state of the text itself demands emendation and in the absence of early manuscripts, conjectural emendation must play an important role in the process. The common argument that an uninterrupted and completely reliable oral transmission has miraculously preserved the text of the Quran from such errors falls flat. The tradition of Quranic recitation can be shown to ignore or run roughshod over many discernible or retrievable features of the text, particularly with regard to rhyme that must represent the oldest stage of its performance. So to an extent, uh, some of that modern apologetic is reading in hindsight because nowadays there's a lot more uniformity in the oral recitation of the Quran, but that was not always the case. Uh, in earlier stages of the transmission of the Quran. And there were three key events that happened in that early uh, transmission that we need to know about. So the first one would be the first Quranic recension by Zayd bin Thabit, which happened under Uthman. And this was such a watershed event in the Quranic history that to this day, we refer to the canonical mainstream Quranic text as the Uthmanic text. But uh, the variation did not end there because there were still a few um, variations that needed to be smoothed over. There was a second Quranic recension that happened in the early 700s under the Caliph Abd al-Malik, and it was done by Al-Hajjaj bin Yusuf. Now, there's some debate as to what exactly Al-Hajjaj bin Yusuf did with the text, but the common understanding is that he probably added long vowels to the Quranic text. So here I have to explain another um, feature of the Quranic language. So in uh, the Arabic uh, language, there are what you call long vowels and short vowels. So how we would normally represent those is uh, the law, the Short A, for example, would be represented by a fatha, which is a little diagonal uh, line that we put on top of a letter. But if it's a long vowel, we would use the letter alif, which is a long uh, vertical stroke, which is considered a which is sometimes considered a consonant when we add a hamza on top of it, and that's often used to denote a long vowel. Now, there were long vowels that were not represented in some of the earliest Quran manuscripts. And what uh, Al-Hajjaj bin Yusuf probably did was he added uh, alifs, waws, and yaz to the Quranic text so that it would be more clearly indicated where these long vowels occurred. Despite that, there were still some differences in recitation. And over time, multiple kira'at uh, emerged uh, from the Uthmanic text. What happened in the early 900s was that a Muslim scholar by name Ibn Mujahid uh, chose seven of the most popular kira'at and he canonized them as the seven standard readings. Now it by, gets a little bit complicated by the way, because, yes. By the way, I just wanted to point out, it's like uh, the, the, the weird thing is um, when whenever I hear about making changes to the Quran. Um, mm -hmm. It's always it's always interesting. It's like, and I haven't talked to Muslims about this, but it's like, I mean, do you believe this guy was divinely inspired to be making these kinds of changes? Like, like Uthman, when he uh, has other, you know, other Quranic materials all burned, and we know that there were people who disagreed with, um, with Zaid on some things. 
Um, or even when even when uh, even when Uthman says that um, if you're going to write out the Quran, write it in the Quraysh dialect and things like that. If, for mm-hmm. for those Muslims who think that the Ahruf are other dialects or something like that, then he would be getting rid of different ways that Allah has revealed them. And, you know, the same thing with Al-Hajjaj and the same thing with Ibn Mujahid. You've got all these different kirat going around. And then Ibn Mujahid says, well, these seven have my you know, stamp of, a, of approval. And the question is like, Muslims, what do you think about him? Do you think he's like divinely inspired so that he, this man can actually point to seven and say, these are the good ones. Don't trust the other ones. It's just this weird situation like, if things are revealed by Allah and Gabriel and Muhammad, and then you've got the original companions, um, on what basis do these later guys have the authority to even be making decisions about about the Quran like this? I've always I've always been interested in that. Yeah, I think what a Muslim might argue is that well, the Quran was first and foremost an oral text, so the different ways of um, writing down the text are just ways of capturing how it was meant to be recited orally. So even if it is written down in different ways, that doesn't impinge on uh, the you know the fundamental form of the Quran as it would be um, found in the eternal heavenly tablet. It also partly depends on which Muslim you're talking to, because for example, um, since we talked about uh, Khalil and Dani, for example, he doesn't believe that the uh, Lauh Mahfud or the eternally preserved tablet contains every single syllable of the Uthmanic Quran. Uh, he thinks that um, the Quran as we have it today is sort of just one manifestation of the context of um, the contents of that tablet. And if there's variation, that's okay because the contents of the etern- of the tablet can be um manifested in different ways actually I'm not even sure that he believes in the eternality of the quran that's more of a sunni concept i'll have to ask him uh more precisely what he thinks on that particular note yeah because i mean given what you given the first part of what you said you can actually mm-hmm. see why even like reading the quran you can see why if, it, if the quran's talking mm-hmm. about the mother of the books and so on mm-hmm. so you've got the mother mm-hmm. of the books you can imagine like uh having different ways of sort of uh, uh, producing the offspring of the book in this world. You know what I mean? you got the mother, that's yeah. that's with Allah, and then the offspring of that somehow are, are the different books that we have now. Right. Actually, I remember uh, when I listened to Jay Smith and Shabir Ali debate back in 2014 on this topic, uh, Shabir had a very interesting analogy uh, for how to explain the different kiraat in light of the eternally preserved tablet. He said, think of the eternally preserved tablet as like, um, you know, a rope uh, with multiple strands in it. And then the different kiraat are sort of like the different strands of that rope. So all those kiraat put together form uh, the rope that makes up the lauh mahfud. Uh, it's a little bit of a funny analogy, but I think that was his best way to explain how uh, someone who holds to a conservative Sunni viewpoint uh, can justify those two things at the same time. I, I actually I, I actually like uh, the direction some of their guys go in with defending the idea of different kirat, because they'll say things like, um, there's only one Quran, but yes, we have these variants and so on. So we've got the the Hafs and the Warsh and so on. Um, but they're all they're all the same yet different and somehow they're all one Quran. And I'm just sitting there thinking, you guys got a problem with the doctrine of the Trinity? You're saying things <laughs> like this? Like you're saying it's it's one in one way, but it's more than one in a different way and they're different but the same and so on. It's like uh, I think uh, I think I might have to use your explanations here at some point. Yeah. So let me illustrate uh, what the difference is between the fully vocalized and unvocalized texts are. So here's an image of the top copy manuscript. This is one of the earliest complete codices we have of the Quran. uh, And this comes from the early 8th century. So if you look on the left hand side, that is the Kufic script. 
Uh, this is how Arabic was written for most of the 8th and 9th centuries. And if you look at it, there's a little bit of vocalization. There's actually a little bit of diacritics here. So the little red dots there uh, are meant to indicate uh, some of the diacritics, but they're sparsely used. Like they're not applied consistently. So you can't at all places rely on them to tell you uh, what the text is meant to say. Compare that with a modern Quranic text. So on the left-hand side, you have the top copy manuscript. On the right-hand side, you have the modern Quranic text with all the diacritics and the um, vocalizations. And you can see there's a lot of stuff that has been added in. Uh, so over the centuries, it was realized by a lot of Muslims who were copying the text that if you relied on a non um, a non dotted or a partially dotted text, people are going to recite that differently. And that was what happened uh, by the time you get to Ibn Mujahid. So as I mentioned, Ibn Mujahid took seven of the most popular kiraat of his time and said these are the canonical ones. Now, it wasn't always the case that people said, oh, there are more than one valid um, ways of reading the text. So before Ibn Mujahid, there were many Muslims who were saying that, well, the reason why these variants exist is because of human error. So Shadi Hikmat Nasser, whom I mentioned earlier, has this to say in his book on the transmission of variant readings. Early Muslim scholars did not look at the variant readings of the Quran as divine revelation. They attributed the Quranic variants to human origins, either to the reader's ijtihad in interpreting the consonantal outline of the Quran, or simply to an error in transmission. This position changed drastically in the later periods, especially after the 5th or 11th century, where the canonical readings started to be treated as divine revelation, i.e. every single variant in the 7 and 10 eponymous readings was revealed by God to Muhammad. So uh, if, when you look at... yes. This is very uh this is important. Someone I haven't watched I haven't watched Farid's response, but uh someone said that Farid was explaining the uh different kiarat and he uh, apparently again I, I can't I can't say this is definitely what he said because someone said that this is what he said. So I'll have to look at so take all this with a grain of salt. But apparently Farid said that uh, these different readings have always been treated as uh, as divine revelations that all go back to Muhammad. And so looks like Farid, as is often the case, is completely out of line uh, with what scholars are saying. So, yeah, I'll have to take a look at what Farid said, and uh, he's going to have to deal with Shadi Nasser here, looks like. Yeah, so a lot of later Muslim Mufassirin such as Ibn Kathir, did hold the view that Farid mentioned. Uh, so it's more like a back, projector, back projection onto an earlier period. But if you look at earlier Mufassirin, such as at Tabari, they did not take this viewpoint. Like if you read uh, at Tabari's tafsir, uh, he will talk about different readings of the Quran and he'll mention, oh, this reading is correct. This reading is not correct. And he will say that, well, the reason why this incorrect reading exists is because of an error. Um, and by the way, that, the that would that would make that's that sort of that's a very commonsensical response. Right. If you're copying a yeah. book, if I had two manuscripts of the Bible and I got a different spelling of a word, it would be pretty commonsensical to say, oh, someone spelled the word differently here rather than. Yeah. Ah, both of these spelling differences were included by the Apostle John, and uh, he wrote it in both ways. You're like, why would why would you say that? It's much easier, much more commonsensical that someone uh, used a different spelling at some point. But they so for you're saying for a while that's exactly what they're doing. They would see a difference and say, okay, uh, someone messed up here in some way. Maybe we can look at look at the manuscripts and figure out which one is the authentic one. And then at some point. Their, uh, their thinking changes, their, their yeah. doctrine of inspiration or whatever, preservation changes, and then they have to say, ah, all this goes back to Muhammad. Yeah, that's more or less what was happening there. Now, it, with the New Testament, it's a little more tricky because some of those spelling differences may be chalked up to the fact that spelling wasn't standardized all the time 
in first century Greek. So you could actually uh, spell certain words in Greek more than one way. Uh, for example, math, uh, the name Matthew can be spelled with a tau uh, theta, or it could be spelled with two thetas. And if you look at early biblical manuscripts, this that we see that some manuscripts will spell Matthew one way, some will spell Matthew the other way. Yeah, even jo um, even even John can be spelled with one new or two news. Yeah, something along those lines. To an extent, the Quran has a similar feature. Uh, so I mentioned the long vowel Aleph. Now, in some places, there's actually a long vowel, but it's not uh, part of the consonantal text. So what they've did. Uh, is they wrote they produced something known as the dagger aleph, which is like a tiny little aleph sitting on top of the letter. So instead of uh, actually putting a an aleph in the consonantal text, they just um, you know write like a mini superscripted aleph on top. So there's some debate. Well, not really. There's some variation in how they would vocalize the text that way. A similar thing happens with the letter Hamza. So there is a certain letter, letter in the Arabic language called the Hamza, which indicates the glottal stop. And a lot of the early manuscripts did not have the Hamza. So going back to this slide, let me see if there's a Hamza in the left hand, right hand side. I don't, okay, I don't see one. But uh, the Hamza was not in most of the early um, copies of the Quran. And, you know, sometimes it'll create the question, well, should you recite this with a glottal stop or not? And the Hamza was introduced as a way of solving that issue. Now, moving on, one of the ironies of the idea of seven uh, canonical kiraat is that a lot of Imam Mujahid's um, work uh, would not have flown with some of his predecessors. Uh, I mentioned a tabri um, comparing variants, for example. I, one of the ironies is that Atabri was quite the um, philologist, so he would use Arabic grammar to compare uh, different variants. And sometimes he would say, this reading is legitimate, this one is illegitimate for this, that, and the other reason. Now, as it turns out, some of the readings that Atabri preferred did not make the canonical seven, and some of the readings that Atabri rejected as illegitimate uh, were actually um, among the canonical seven. So Ibn Mujahid's uh, canonization would, uh, is not by any means unanimous, uh, would not have been considered unanimous by the people before him. Now, Christopher Melkert, in his discussion of the establishment of the seven chronic readings, uh, mentions this. If Ibn Mujahid and his contemporaries tended to assimilate Quran transmission to Hadith transmission by stressing acceptable chains of transmission, their assimilation was very incomplete. Ibn Mujahid appears to have been careless about chains of transmission. Now, this is going to be important when you understand how Muslims discuss the transmission of these things. Um, so it says here, he omitted to mention links in his own account of his chosen seven. Also, he did not assert that the seven readings of his choice were the product of integral transmission. Uh, how many times, again, do you hear Muslim apologists say, well, we know that these different kiraat go back to Muhammad because we have a train chain of transmission uh, tracing them all the way back to Muhammad himself. Yep, heard that. Yeah. Yeah, so as Christopher Melkert points out, that's not the case. Ibn Mujahid did not assert that this was the case. Uh, so his um, chains of transmission uh, would not have been up to par by later standards. And one of the interesting things is, as Nasser points out in his book on uh, transmission of variant readings, while a lot of Muslim, while every Muslim scholar believes that the uh, Quran is mutawatir, or is the problem? Uh, it is the uh, product of such integral transmission uh, that does not necessarily apply to any given kira'a of the Quran. Which, to me, I have to scratch my head because how can you have a text that has tawatir if it if the various kira'at that comprise the Quran do not have tawatir? Um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Uh, for this, it would be like saying that a certain um, presidential candidate was the most popular 
throughout the United States, but you can't name a single state where he is the most popular. So I'm like, well, then how is he the most popular Antoro if you can't think of a specific place where he would be considered that? And it's the same with these Kira'at. So uh, they are not, according to Ibn Mujahid himself, uh, the product of this uh, impeccable uh, transmission. Uh, do you have any comments on this? Because I have some really interesting material that I want to unpack. No, I, I mean, really, I'm just thinking about how like their their ideas and methodologies change over time. And then they they sort of retrofit everything into their new theory. So, like, I mean, the the method of, you know, uh, of verifying hadiths that evolved over time. So based on what you're yes. saying, it's, it sounds like they come up with a methodology for dealing with hadiths and even though it's human be it's mere human beings coming up with this methodology then they go ahead and apply that to the transmission of the quran a a, yes. a and a methodology that they invented for hadiths and then they apply that to the quran and then it's claimed that these qurans satisfy these hadith methodologies which are uh, met again methodologies that they came up with right. but i mean what what it reminds me of is um and then they'll judge and then they'll judge, you know, copies of the Quran based on this methodology. But it reminds me of like if you go back to the earliest, um, the earliest Muslim historians, they all took the story of like the satanic verses for granted. They took it as, as a fact that Muhammad uh, delivered verses to his followers that promoted uh, prayers to three pagan goddesses as long as Allah yeah. is this, as long as the, the Allah is the supreme God. Um, but in a um, the the in re, so for the the earliest basically it, all of the first century took this for granted that this happened because their doctrine of God's uh, preservation of prophets or God's protection of prophets Ismat al Anbiya their doctrine was that God will not allow a prophet to persist in any major error so. If you if a prophet makes a major error, Allah is going to bring him out of that eventually. And so the story of the satanic verses fit perfectly with the theology of the time, namely that he did make a huge error. He delivered verses that came from Satan promoting polytheism. But then Allah takes him out of that error. And uh, the angel Gabriel, you know, tells him, hey, you got that from Satan. Stop doing that. Uh, whereas later the doctrine of Allah's protection of the prophets changed and the doctrine changed too. Allah is going to protect his prophets from ever entering into any major error. So you can't have a prophet promoting polytheism because that would be major error. And so the doctrine changed late. So the, the doctrine later changed and then they basically make history fit with their new doctrine. And so it's just interesting that the, the course of Islamic history is eventually you get uh, to scholars who defend some new methodology, but then they go back and make everything fit that methodology, even though it didn't fit the methodology because the methodology didn't come along till later. But they're examining the Quran, Hadith narrations, uh, historical events, all in light of later things that human beings developed. And so, again, I would wonder, guys, do you, do you think these guys, these later guys were somehow inspired like prophets to make these yeah. kinds of decisions? Or were they merely human beings doing the best they could, in which case they could be mistaken? And if they could be mistaken on which Quran is correct or which Quran should be getting, which, which copies of the Quran should be affirmed and so on, I don't know, the problems look like... That, they're yeah. significantly worse than most Muslims are aware of. Yeah, funny you should mention the satanic verses because there's another book that I should plug in here. Again, this is a sidebar, uh, but um, uh, Professor Saleh suggested this to me. But there's a book called Before Orthodoxy, yeah. subtitled The Satanic Verses in Early Islam. Uh, the author is named Shahab Ahmed. And a lot of the stuff that you say uh, is mentioned by Shahab Ahmed in this book he mentioned that well actually a lot of early muslims uh accepted the satanic verses um, um as a an authentic incident in the life of the prophet and which is why you see it in for example ibn ishaq or at tabari 
And the reason why later Muslims reject this is because some of the more um, the more stringent uh, views on hadith transmission had not yet trickled down to, uh, say, the writing of Sira or history. Uh, but once it did, then that uh, standard was back projected onto uh, Ibn Ishaq and Atabari and their recounting of these um, events. So that's a book that people might want to look into if they were want to uh, research this particular topic. Now, I want to show you guys uh, examples of continental variants. I've been talking about continental variants earlier, but I haven't yet actually shown you guys any examples of it. So some of these uh, are actually post Ibn Mujahid. So uh, contrary to what some people might uh, say, the canonization of the seven did not eliminate uh, these variants. Rather, what happened to these variants is they got assigned a category known as anomalous or shad. And Shadi Hikmat Nasser in his book actually has uh, many examples of it that he records. So let me start by showing you a few of the more notable examples that Nasser points to. So the first one in Surah 89, Ayah 18, in the Uthmanic text, uh, uh, as recorded in the 1924 Cairo edition, edition it says this: ala ta'am al to feed the poor. Yeah, so there is an anomalous variant here where an extra ta is added to the word tahadun. So that um, would be you see the the line with the two dots on top of it. That is the letter ta. It makes the t sound. Um, so the one with the extra ta would yield the verb tatahadun. Uh, for those who do not know Arabic grammar, this is a difference in what you call the verbal form or the wazin. Uh, so one of the features of Arabic grammar is that uh, to form a word, a verb in particular, uh, you have to basically take the root, which is the three letters, and then you um, put them into a certain form or a stem, that is the wazin. And depending on what was in the verb takes, it may slightly alter uh, the meaning of the verb. So uh, the extra tat there would, hmm, my, let me see, I'm trying to figure out how that would change the meaning. Uh, it'll be a very subtle one. I don't think it would even be translatable, uh, but it does change what the was in of the verb is. And it definitely changes the orthography of the manuscript because uh, the an extra a line would be added to the word, which would be visible even if you did not have diacritics. Now let's go to another example, which would be highly visible even without diacritics. In Surah 86, verse 6, uh, it says, Hulika min ma in doth death. So dafiq is the word for spurting. So in English, we would translate this as he was created from spurting water. Dafiq is what you call a fa'il or an active participle form uh, from the verb dafaqa. Now, there is one variant reading where instead of an active participle, it would be a passive participle, uh, it would be madfuq. So it would be the difference between spurting water or spurted water. Obviously, that's a very... Um, you know, fine shade of meaning, uh, which wouldn't necessarily impact uh, the text in a major way, except that um, there is a clear difference in the orthography here. And I don't think you can chalk this up to a mere difference in oral recitation because defek and manfuk sound very different in the way they are um, recited. Uh, so this is what you call a derivative variant. So the same verbal root is used, but they have a different derived form. So it's the difference between a passive and an active participle. Now, another one in Surah 88, uh, Ayah 2, uh, it says, Lasta alehim bi musaitir. Now, this one is very interesting to me because according to Nasser, uh, the letter Saad, uh, in Musaitir is sometimes replaced with either a seen or a zayin. 
So for those who don't know Arabic, let me show you the difference. It's the difference between Musaitir, Musaitir, and Muzaitir. Now, just hearing me say that, you can see that they're not exactly identical, but they're very similar to each other. Similar enough that if you were hearing someone recite it orally, you could see how someone could mishear one letter for the other and write it accordingly. But this would tell me that this particular variant is the result of someone hearing a text recited orally and copying down what he heard because there's no way you would have gotten this kind of variant from looking at the consonantal text. Uh, the letters Saad, Zayin, and Sin look very different from each other even without the diacritics. So far, so good. I have a couple of other interesting uh, variants to show. This one is also the product of oral um, recitation. So in Surah 95, Ayah 5, it says, Thumma radadnahu asfala safilin. Then we will reduce him to the lowest of a low. Now, there is one anomalous variant that Nasser records where the word safilin has the definite article al in it. Now, one of the things that uh, maybe not everyone necessarily knows is that the definite article al, sometimes the L sound in it becomes assimilated to the letter that comes right above it or right after it. So you wouldn't say al safilin, but you say as safilin. Um, so the L sound disappears and the S sound from the scene um, becomes more pronounced. Now, if you were to say, with a definite article versus without the definite article, the difference would be so slight that it would be almost impossible to uh, recognize in a purely oral recitation. So it would be easy to see how a variation like this uh, could arise from someone listening to an oral recitation and copying down what he heard. Now, I have one more resum variant uh, to show you. Uh, this one is kind of interesting. So there's that famous verse in Surah Al-Ikhlas that says, Lem yalid wa lem yulid. He begets not, nor is he begotten. There's one anomalous variant that Nasser mentions where the two verbs are actually uh, switched places. So instead of lam yalid wa lam yulid, it says lam yulid wa lam yalid. He neither is begotten nor does he beget. So this is classified by Nasser as a transposition where two words are reversed in their usual order. So, you know, when I mention shadh uh, variants or anomalous variants, these are the sort of variants that um, Nasser has in mind, which are different from the uh, canonical seven, but are nonetheless present in some of our extant manuscripts. So um, Frederick Lemwis in Readings of the Quran, in the Encyclopedia of the Quran, uh, talks about the fact that a lot of these variant readings were well known to Muslim commentators. Um, a lot of tafasir uh, actually make mention of it. So it's not like Muslims are trying to hide this stuff for the better part of the classical period until fairly recent times. Yeah. This was actually well known among Muslim scholars. So it's yeah, you can here. even even if you even if you read some of the classical comments, like if you read Tafsir Jalalain, he's constantly yeah. pointing out, hey, there's another there's another reading of this yeah. verse. There's a different oh, some some read it according to this, you know, and and he'll put the textual mm -hmm. variants in the uh in the text there which which is you know part of what made it so odd that you yeah. their classical commentators are actually pointing out textual variants in different readings and so on and then you got down to the more recent time and it seems like the dawa guys just just wanted the quran to be different from the bible they wanted to be able to attack the bible but say that the quran has something special about it and so i, I don't even know what to do other than just assume that there were it was a complete lie because anyone who knows about anything is going to be familiar. Like the point is, even if you just read the commentaries, you would be aware of textual variants, even if you never looked at manuscripts. So it's like, where does this come from? It just looks like a, like a flat out lie. Yeah. And the funny thing is we haven't even talked about uh, non-Othmanic 
codices yet. Everything that we've discussed up to this point are variations within the Othmanic text tradition. Uh, once we start adding in the companion codices by Ibn Mas'ud or by, by Ibn Qab or the, even the Sana'a Palimpsest, which I'll be talking about very shortly, uh, then the range of variants becomes even wider. So here uh, in Lemus's article, he says this, the introduction of the Othmanic Rasm does not seem to have had an immediate decisive effect on the limitation of variant readings with a different Rasm. In Sufyan Athauri's relatively short tafsir, for example, 67 variant readings, all introduced with fi kira'at, or in the reading of, or kana yakra unnaha, uh, are mentioned, 24 of which have a different rasm. Most of these are synonyms that are attributed to Ibn Mas'ud. So a lot of these variants apparently come from non Othmanic texts. Uh, some of them are Uthmanic, but some of them also have a non-Uthmanic origin. So here is where we transition to what are known as the companion codices. And you're probably well aware of these because you've mentioned them before in some of your past uh, discussions on this topic. The two most well-known individuals in this regard are Abdullah bin Mas'ud and Ubay bin Qab. And they're both mentioned as premier transmitters in a lot of the hadith tradition. So in Sahih al-Bukhari, it says this, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud was mentioned before Abdullah bin Amr. The latter said, that is the man I continue to love because I heard Allah's messenger saying, learn the recitation of the Quran from any of these four persons. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, Salim, the freed slave of Abu Hudayfa, Ubay bin Kab, and Mu'adh bin Jabal. I do not remember whether he mentioned Ubay first or Mu'adh. So, According to this, um, Muhammad considered both of these individuals as trustworthy reciters of the Quran, which gets really interesting once we start talking about the contents of uh, their codices. It's also also interesting because I don't see uh, Zayed or even Uthman on that list. Yeah, nope, they are not on the list. So uh, the fact that they canonized the mainstream a Quran uh, after Muhammad's time? Well, let's just say I'm not entirely uh, sure that Muhammad would have approved of what they did, uh, but it's hard to judge uh, what a deceased person would have thought um, uh, posthumously. Anyway, you are your readers are probably well familiar with this episode. So after the Uthmanic standardization, uh, the owners of the companion codices uh, objected of man's readings and insisted on keeping their own. So in Jamia Tirmidhi, you have this episode that is recorded for us. Uh, Ubaidullah bin Abdullah bin Utba informed me that Abdullah bin Mas'ud disliked Zay bin Thabit's copying the Musahif and he said, O you Muslim people, avoid copying the Mus'haf and the recitation of this man. By Allah, when I accepted Islam, he was but in the loins of a disbelieving man, meaning Zayd bin Thabit. And it was regarding this that Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, O people of Al-Iraq, keep the Masahif that are with you and conceal them. For indeed Allah said, and whoever conceals something, he shall come with what he concealed on the day of judgment. So meet Allah with the Masahif. So it's clear here that Ibn Mas'ud had a Mus'haf of the Quran, that Mus'haf differed from uh, Zayd bin Thabit's recension, and he rejected the alternate readings of Zayd bin Thabit in favor of his own. And uh, go back to that real quick, because uh, this is, I mean, for people who aren't familiar with the names that are being used here, I mean, this is huge, right? So the, the Quran that Muslims use today uh, ultimately goes back supposedly to the Uthmanic recension where Uthman told Zayd ibn Thabit to compile the Quran. But other companions of Muhammad were compiling their own Qurans, and they actually had a problem with Zayd's Quran. So this is about Abdullah ibn Masud. He's getting the, the ruling on the official uh, Zayd version that they're now supposed to use, and they're being told, hand over your Quran so they can be destroyed, so that we can put out this one official Quran. And Ibn Masud is saying, no, hide your Qurans. Do not hand them over to this guy. Keep your Qurans. Do not go along with this, uh, with this new edition of the Quran. 
And so this is a guy who's rejecting Zayed's Quran, which again, this is the Quran that Muslims would give their stamp of approval today. And so you might say, well, who is who is who is Ibn Masood to be saying that he doesn't like Zayd's Quran? Who is he? What authority does he have? Well, he just happens to be the guy Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from Abdullah Ibn Masood. So what do you do? Is was did Muhammad pick the wrong guy when he said, hey, you want to learn it? The, learn the Quran from someone? Learn it from him. Did Muhammad pick the wrong guy? Muhammad didn't know what a good Quran reciter was. Or did Muhammad know who his best reciters were? And therefore, Muslims should really be paying attention when Muhammad's top Quran reciters say that they disagree with something about mm -hmm. Zayed's Quran. These are the issues that arise. Your average Muslim has no clue about any of this because their leaders don't tell them about any of this. Yeah. Also, I'm inclined to accept that these things really happen because they're the sort of things, if you're familiar with the criterion of embarrassment, uh, they're not the sort of things that Muslims would come up with if they wanted to present a cleaner history of their text. The fact that these narratives are in their own hadith uh, tradition, to me, is an indication that these things or something very similar to them really did happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Ibn Mas'ud's codex has been mostly lost to history. Uh, we don't have an actual codex uh, or mushaf of Ibn Mas'ud's reading. The closest we have to it would be um, recordings of what they contained in Qira'at literature. So uh, Jeffrey, in his materials for the history of the text of the Quran, uses uh, some of that Qira'at literature, chiefly Ibn Abi Dawud, and he records what those variants were. So here's one page of Jeffrey's book where he shows you those variants. There's some really interesting ones in here. So I'll give you well, one of my favorite ones. So in Surat al-Fatiha, you know, in the canonical readings, uh, Muslims recite to this day, you would say, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, guide us along the straight path. Well, in Ibn Mas'ud's codex, it says, Irshedna sirat al-mustaqim. So instead of Ihdina, it would say Irshedna. So imagine you had a whole community of people um, doing their Salat prayers, and then when they start reciting Surat al-Fatiha, Instead of saying Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, they would recite Irshidna Sirat al Mustaqim. Like Muslims today, if they heard that, would lose their minds. But the fact that this variant is here means that Ibn Mas'ud and his followers were reciting a different version of Al Fatiha. So, so just to be clear, I mean, the the common Muslim belief that we get. So the first common belief is that there are no variants. There are no textual variants. Once you show that there are textual variants, they'll say things like, ah, but the oral recitation is so perfect that if anyone were to make an error, it would be caught. And what you're saying is you go back to the earliest, the earliest companions of Muhammad, and they not only had uh, variants in their recitation of the Quran, they had variants in the recitation of the chapter that they recited most frequently. Like the most, like, yeah. like the point is, if they're, if your method of an entire community is reciting something, therefore no one's going to get anything wrong. If you actually believed that, the greatest example of it should be Surat al-Fatiha. That should be like no var no not even a possibility of variant uh, of 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 a, of a variant, because if Muhammad reveals it and then they're using it all the time in their prayers, and the whole community is using it in their prayers, how are you ever going to get a difference? Maybe somewhere way down the road, if some guy is a brand new Muslim, he goes to an island with the Quran and he's never heard anything. Uh, correct. Maybe he comes up with some mistake or something like that. But when it's Ibn Masood, Ibn Masood disagreeing with Zayat, these are both guys who should know what Surat al-Fatiha is supposed to be. And yet even there we find variants. Right. Now, to be fair, Ihnina and Irshidna are synonyms. Like if you were to translate them into English, they would still say guide us on the straight path. But the that still would be problematic for the common um, narrative because replacing a word with its synonym even if you know it doesn't change the meaning necessarily it still does introduce uh, a, a variation at the consonantal level 
which is precisely what a lot of the apologists are trying to deny happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, even after Ibn Mas'ud and his Mus'haf were sidelined, that doesn't mean people completely ignored it. In the tafsir tradition, we actually have examples of Ibn Mas'ud's Mus'haf or his Qara'a being appealed to um, to explain certain verses. Uh, and I have two examples of that. The first one is Surah 17, Ayah 93, where it says, Aw yakuna laka baytu min zukhruf. And literally, you would translate this, or you have a house of ornamentation, which if you read that, you would probably be wondering, what is house of ornamentation? And a lot of Mufassirin had the same question as well. Now, Abdar Razak actually had a tradition that he narrates from Ibn Mujahid, where he says the following, we did not know what uh, Beit Zukhruf was until we saw in the Qira'a of Ibn Mas'ud, Beit Dhahab. So Dhahab means gold. So you have Beit Zukhruf, house of ornamentation, versus the more precise Beit Dhahab, um, house of gold. And if you look, interestingly, at a lot of English translations of the Quran, um, and you can check that right now, how many of them have house of gold as the way they render Surah 1793? Uh, I checked, and a good number of them have it. But the Uthmanic text doesn't say house of gold. It says house of ornamentation. House of gold is the Mas Ibn Mas'ud reading, which the Mufassirin have taken and used to explain uh, Beit Zuhruf. Right, let, let, me, let, me, let me go ahead and give you an answer. I just pulled up 10 translations of the Quran. Pickthal says house of gold. Yusuf Ali says adorned with gold. Uh, house adorned with gold. Uh, Hilali Khan said house of adornable materials. So that's more like the uh, ornament. Uh, M.H. Shakir says house of gold. Sher Ali says house of gold. Khalifa says uh, luxurious mansion. Arbery, house of gold ornament. Uh, Palmer, house of gold. Rodwell, house of gold. Um, Sale, hmm. house of gold. So what you're saying is that it doesn't actually say in the current, um, in the, in the, let's say Hafs Quran, it doesn't say that it's house of um, ornament, but yeah. that based on how it was read by Ibn, Mas Ibn Masood's version said house of gold. And so they're actually taking that into account as, as like a, a tool of interpreting correctly what it's referring to. And then they're translating it based on Ibn Masood's reading where the reading that they currently have just isn't clear. Right. So, yeah, it, the original, the text by itself isn't clear. Um, the tafsirs are all using this tra tradition of understanding Zuhruf as gold. But ultimately, that tradition goes back to Ibn Mas'ud, the very person whose Mus'haf was sidelined. It's still the ghost of Ibn Mas'ud's codex lives, lives on in the tafsir tradition, uh, as it were. Now, here's the interesting thing. Tafsir is not the only place where Ibn Mas'ud continues to exert an influence. It also exerts influence in fiqh. Now, this, the other variant reading is in Surah 589. Uh, in the Uthmanic text, it says, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَسِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةَيَامُ Whoever does not find the means must fast for three days. So in context, this is referring to what you do if you break an oath. And one of the options for what you uh, do when you break an oath is fast for three days. Now, there's a question that the um, um, scholars of fiqh have wondered. Well, is it three consecutive days or is it three days in general, even if you break them apart? Now, in the Hanafi madhab, they believe that it should be three consecutive days, but the text doesn't explicitly say three consecutive days. You know where it does say three consecutive days? Ibn Mas'ud's Mus'haf, because there it says mutatabi'in uh, or mutatabi'at after the word ayam. So, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَسِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةَ يَامْ mutatabi'at, Three consecutive days. So there it's explicit. The Hanafi school is implicitly using uh, the way Ibn Mas'ud read the text, even if they're not using Ibn Mas'ud's actual Mus'haf. And the, these kind of variants are interesting because um, there will be lots of variants where it's not going to affect 
uh, Islamic theology or Islamic practice in any way. Mm -hmm. But here, this is something that will actually affect your practice. It's not, you know, it's not a major uh, effect on Muslim practice, but this is, and this, your understanding of what this verse is saying, does it affect your practice? It does affect how you're yeah. going to do this. Whether you think if you, if you just read what the Quran says, and it just says, uh, fast for three days and you think, oh, okay, I'll fast every Wednesday for the next uh, three weeks or something like that. And that would be right. fine. Or is it three days straight? And that's going to depend on which version you're reading. So this is actually something that affects how Muslims would would obey a, a, a command here. Yes, that is correct. So Mutatabi'at um, in Ibn Mas'ud's Mus'haf makes explicit what would at best be implicit in 580 in the Uthmanic text. I mean, you could, I can sort of see how you can infer consecutiveness uh, from the way it's read, but there is still an ambiguity in the Uthmanic text that is not in Ibn Mas'ud's version. Um, now, Going, going on, we have Ubay bin Kab as well. So he is another one of the people that um, were mentioned. So here's another variation of the tradition of the four people collecting the Quran. Now this time, uh, Zaid bin Thabit is mentioned as one of the four people uh, who collected it. Now, you know, uh, how do you square this with the previous uh, hadith? Um, you know, I'll leave that up to Muslims to figure out. But the point here is that uh, two people with very different codices are mentioned, Ubay bin Kab and Zay bin Thabit. And just like with uh, Ibn Mas'ud, uh, Ubay bin Kab had a diff, you know, disagreed with Zay bin Thabit's readings and insisted on keeping his own. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, 5005, where it says, Omar said, Ubay was the best of us in the recitation of the Quran, yet we leave some of what he recites. Ubay says, I have taken it from the mouth of Allah's messenger and will not leave for anything whatever. But Allah said, none of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar. Uh, so you have here Omar uh, disagreeing with Ubay's reading uh, in that Ubay had some extra material that's not in the standard text. And Omar uh, justifies leaving those things out using Surah 2106, saying those things that Ubay um, recites have been abrogated. Now, how do we know they were abrogated or not? Well, Omar says so. Um, and by the way, there's uh, uh, I, I know you've got some variants here, but um, uh, it's yes. interesting that you have a parallel with uh, with, you know, later commentators and so on using uh, Ibn Masud's version in order to understand or illuminate verses that might be unclear. Uh, you also have, I mean, even to modern times, like in Surah 33, verse 6 of the Yusuf Ali translation, Yusuf Ali includes a note. So Surah 33, verse 6, that's the verse that says Muhammad's wives are the mothers of, of the believers. But uh, uh, Yusuf Ali has a footnote and he says, uh, in some kiraz, uh, such as that of Ubay ibn Kab occur also the words, and he is a father of them. So yeah. that's interesting that it, it's like, and then he, he, he makes a point about this emphasizing the spiritual connection of the believers to Muhammad. And it's like, wait, but there's not even in the Quran that people use today. He's actually using Ubay's, Ubay's Quran, which includes extra words in order to make a point about how uh, close Muslims are to Muhammad. And so it's just interesting that, that even though they'll simultaneously be talking about perfect preservation and so on, they're clearly being influenced by other, uh, other, other readings of the Quran uh, yeah. that don't line up with what, what we have today. So anyway, it's interesting stuff. Yeah, it's interesting to me how they would reject the readings, yet those readings continue to influence the way they read the text. Uh, so here are some of the variants that appear in Ubay bin Kab's codex. Uh, he doesn't have quite as many variations from the Uthmanic text that Ibn Mas'ud does, but he does nevertheless have a number of significant ones, including differences in the rasam. So I'll point to one example here. Uh, it's a subtle one, uh, Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight way. Uh, here, the word sirata uh, has a definite article in it. Uh, in the Uthmanic text, it doesn't. You know, that doesn't change 
the text a great deal. In fact, you might not even notice uh, the difference in an oral recitation because the al gets assimilated into the sod. Uh, but in the orthography, there is a definite difference here. Uh, actually, funny enough, it would be more grammatically correct to have an al there because you always want to make sure that the noun and the adjective agree with each other on definiteness. That that, But that's a whole other story. So, as I mentioned, both Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Qab's Musahif have been lost to history. We don't have actual copies of them anymore. Uh, we only know what they contain from Ibn Abi Dawud and other Qira'at literature. We do have, however, a non-Othmanic codex in the form of the Sana'a Palimpsest. So this is the last major uh, text that I want to discuss as part of our discussion of chronic textual transmission. So on the left-hand side, you have a picture of what the Sana'a Palimpsest looks like. So a pa Palimpsest, for those who are unfamiliar with uh, this terminology, is a text, you, and a piece of writing material, usually a parchment, um, where the earlier text has been scraped off and then a new text has been placed on top of it. Most of the time, Palimpsest's occur in parchments. The reason for this is it's parchment. It's kind of like leather. It's a very sturdy material. You can scrape uh, writing off with a knife and it would still be usable for writing. Um, so if you look at the picture of the manuscript on the left-hand side, you'll notice that there's one layer of text, but if you look closely, there's another layer that is right below it, and that is what is known as the lower text as opposed to the upper text. Uh, the interesting thing is that those who study the lower text have found that it yields a Quranic text that is very different from the Othmanic text. Um, a number of studies have been published on this text over the past few decades. One of the most recent one is Asma Hilali's The Sana'a Palimpsest, The Transmission of the Quran in the First Centuries, uh, Anno Hijri. And she actually provides um, a transcription of the both the upper and the lower text of the Sana'a Palimpsest, as well as a list of the different places where it varies from the 1924 Cairo Codex. Um, and this is the picture of the Great Mosque of Sana'a. It's actually very interesting to talk about how the Palimpsest was discovered. So they were renovating the Great Mosque of Sana'a, when uh, some people poking around uh, discovered a false ceiling in a part of the mosque. And on top of that false ceiling was a repository of old Quran manuscripts that were no longer being used. And one of the Quran manuscripts uh, that was found there was the aforementioned palimpsest, which has been studied by people such as Gerd Puin, as well as uh, Benham Sedegi and Mohsen Gudarzi, and most recently by Asma Hilali. And they all have interesting insights into the text, although they don't always agree on how to analyze the text. So for the upper text, Asma Hilali uh, lists 17 variants. Of those 17, three involve difference in the consonantal text, while the rest are differences in the diacritical markers. So this is the aforementioned changing of the dots. So where one might have a difference in having two dots above, some might have two dots below or only one dot above, etc. That's the difference between a ta, a nun, and a ya. The lower text is where the fun stuff is because she counted 61 variants. And bear in mind, the lower text is an unvocalized, un undotted text, which means all of those differences are differences in the rasm. And a lot of the variants that were found in the palimpsest actually had longer wording than their counterparts in the 1924 Cairo edition, uh, which Muslims use. So I'll give you two examples of these variants. So by the way, as I mentioned, the texts are unvocalized. Uh, you might notice that this one does have vocalizations. I'm using the version that Marijn Van Putin used in one of his presentations. He added those uh, for clarification. So in Surah 222, 
uh, sorry, sorry, Surah 2, Ayah 222, it says, uh, at, at fi al-mahid, fil mahid, wala uh, tak, takrabuhunna hatta yatharna. So, you know, don't approach your wives until they purify themselves. Now, in the Sana'a Palimpsest, there's a slight rearranging of the words. Uh, there it says, Fala takrabun anisa'a fi muhidduhunna hatta yatharna. Still means the same thing, but uh, a lot of the words have been switched around. The word order is different. Um, instead of al-muhid, it says muhid Um So you added a pronominal suffix on the word mahid. Um, and then another one, which is also equally interesting, is in Surah 973. Um, in the Othmanic text, it says wa'aglud. Alehim wa mawa'ahum jahannam. So jahannam is the Arabic word for hell. In the palimpsest, it says, wa aglud alehim wa ma'awahum anar. So anar means the fire. So you replace the word hell with the synonym fire. Now, of course, Muslims will ask, well, what's the difference? They both mean the same thing. And I'll say, yes, you are right. It does mean the same thing. But it is still a difference in the continental text. And this is not merely a difference in oral recitation. It's a completely different word. You can even without knowing Arabic, you can see that it's a different word. And um, and it and it sort of lines up with with you pointing out that uh, a lot of the variants that you find in Ibn Masud are uh, basically synonyms. And so yeah. the the impression you get from the Sana uh, palimpsest and uh, the variance in Ibn Masud is it just looks like it was acceptable to use to use synonyms back then. If you thought, uh, you know, this word would be better or maybe a little clearer than the word that uh, other Muslims are reciting um, and that this was this was not uh, it's not some some great problem. So like like they right. don't have a problem with it. Yes. So during the first Islamic century, uh, reading Ershedna instead of Ihnina or Dahab instead of Zuhruf or Anar instead of Jahannam would not have been controversial. It only became controversial uh, when Muslims started becoming very uh, conscious about precise recitation. And once that consciousness emerges, suddenly using Jahannam Anar instead of Jahannam becomes verboten, even though you could argue it doesn't change the meaning whatsoever. Now, there is one little um, side issue that might come up if you discuss the Sana'a palimpsest. Um, Asma Hilali had a very controversial um, thesis in her book, uh, which is that the Sana'a palimpsest is not really a mushaf or a codex. It's more loose leaves from the writing exercises of a scribal circle. So the idea was that you had a bunch of students um, copying down what they heard their master recite. And this wasn't meant to be used in an actual worship context or study context, but just, you know, a writing exercise. But and by the way, that, no one, no one, no one agrees with her on this, right? Yes. Yes. I'm actually getting to that. Oh, okay, so um, the only people I know who agree with Hilali's um, thesis uh, would be people like Shabir Ali and certain Muslim apologists who think that, well, uh, Hilali's uh, thesis proves that the Sana of Palimpsest isn't really a valuable source of textual information. We can safely disregard its readings. Well, so wait, wait, hang on. Hang on. So, so just to be just to be clear, so everyone understands. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, we, we basically got the Quran and, and Muslims typically claim, you know, amazing, wonderful uh, preservation of the Quran. Then all of a sudden, you have something that that might be and is, according to many thinkers, something that's pre Uthmanic. So it's before the time of Uthman. And you have all these variants throughout it and different orderings of things and so mm -hmm. on. And occasionally a missing verse or occasionally something extra. And so Muslims are, hey, how do you explain this? And so people are saying that this is this wasn't a copy of the Quran. This is basically a student's notebook where he's yeah. practicing writing, and that's why you get all the variants. And so yes. something along those lines, right? Yes. 
that's exactly how it is. So uh, should, I remember uh, I had a discussion uh, with a Muslim colleague who was appealing to Hilali's thesis to argue that, well, the Sana'a palimpsest variants, they're no big deal. It's just a student making mistakes. Well, see, here's the problem with that. Every single scholar who has studied the Sana'a palimpsest disagrees with uh, Hilali on this thesis. Puin uh, thinks that the Sana'a palimpsest is a mushaf. Uh, Godarzi and Sadegi think it is a mushaf. And Nikolai Sinai thinks it's a mushaf. In fact, Nikolai Sinai, in his article Beyond the Cairo Codex, criticizes Hilali for her thesis, uh, saying that uh, a lot of it relies on, quote, anachronistic misconceptions about the standards of scribal and decorative accuracy, consistency, and uniformity that would have been deemed appropriate in the first Islamic century. So in other words, nobody really accepts Hilali's thesis. Uh, the only reason uh, I even need to mention this is because uh, I want to um, cut off at the pass, as it were, any Muslim apologists who might want to use it uh, as a reason to disregard the palimpsest. Also, one other thing, even if uh, Hilali's thesis was correct and these were writing exercises from a scribal circle, that it doesn't follow from that that the palimpsest isn't valuable because you still have to ask, well, where is the student getting these readings from? Who told him to write Anar instead of Jahannam? Obviously, uh, this uh, palimpsest, even if it is just uh, a writing exercise, still attests to an alternate reading tradition that still needs to be explained. So uh, I can tell you what a lot of scholars do think about the Sun'a palimpsest. So Quranic scholar Andrew Rippin says the following, quote, their variant readings and verse orders are all very significant. These manuscripts say that the early history of the Quranic text is much more of an open question than many have suspected. The text was less stable and therefore had less authority than has always been claimed. He said this in an article for The Atlantic back in 1999. Uh, more recently, uh, Nikolai Sinai uh, says the following in the aforementioned article. Thus, the Sun'a palimpsest would appear to provide us with an exciting glimpse at a moment in time at which the hegemony of the Quran standard Rassam had not yet become for, fully established. This, it must be said, is in line with the general drift of the Islamic tradition, which reports that during the first decades after Muhammad's death, a variety of Quranic recensions were in circulation. This lends credence to the idea that there was originally more than one recension of the Quran and that the Islamic literary sources preserve a broadly accurate view of the scale and character of textual variants between these different versions of the Arabic scripture. So here you have uh, both Sinai uh, and Ripin saying that the Sun'a palimpsest shows us that there was a time in the first Islamic century when the writing of the Quran uh, was much more loose. There was not as much of a focus on um, identical transmission and you had much more significant variants. So here we get to my conclusion on the textual diversity of the Quran. So I mentioned Keith Small and his book. This is what he has to say on the diversity. All of this is an indication that the literature as it stands is not a complete record of the variants once existing in the Quranic manuscript tradition. That the tradition at one time did indeed contain many more variants than are now extant in the period just prior to the inferior text of the extant palimpsest, and also very possibly in Islam's first three centuries prior to Ibn Mujahid. By the way, uh, just a note, when he says inferior, he doesn't mean lower quality. Uh, when, when we're talking about a palimpsest, we usually refer to the lower text as the inferior text to, me, to indicate the fact that uh, it comes before uh, the text above it. Um, moving on, there is the very definite possibility that these kinds of variants were much more common during the earliest period of the transmission of the Quran than was the case later on. Their disappearance from the later stages of the manuscript tradition is evidence that they represent an early stage in the editing and standardization of the text. Brubaker agrees with this uh, in his uh, conclusion on corrections in early Quran manuscripts where he states, Having looked at thousands of corrections in early Quranic manuscripts, most of which are not attested to in any of the Qur'at literature, um, 
Daniel Bubreyer concludes that these corrections must represent, in at least some cases, another phenomenon, such as perhaps a greater degree of perceived flexibility of the Quran text in its early centuries, the time of first production of these manuscripts, than is documented in the Qur'at literature. So here you have um, the fact that there is considerable diversity in uh, manuscripts in the Quran, and we can see this in the extant text. Will we discover new manuscripts in the future that might yield more variants? Well, God alone knows, but Quranic textual criticism is a work in progress. Everything that I have said up to this point is tentative, and who knows how much differently uh, we will be talking about uh, this field five or ten years from now, once we've discovered new findings. Now, I want to talk about the theological significance of all of this. So why are we discussing this issue? Is it just an academic exercise or does it have real world consequences? So as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm not trying to disprove that the Quran is the word of God. That is beyond the scope of my thesis. Uh, none of the conclusions that I have arrived at necessitate that or that all forms of Islam are rendered false. It does, however, pose problems for those interpretations of Islam that rely on simplistic narratives of textual transmission and or believe that every single word in the Quran is contained in an eternal heavenly tablet. Uh, that is, of course, a view of the Quran that not all Muslims hold to, but there are some who do, and for them, this could pose problems. It does pose problems for one other group of people, and is the ones who try to argue that the Quran is stylistically excellent. Of course, you know this argument, right? The Quran uh, proves it is the word of God. And you can see this from the fact that uh, it has the best possible uh, form that cannot be imitated by anyone else. Well, uh, I actually have a two-part discussion uh, of this topic in Reason and Theology, um, which you can check out. Uh, the title is, Is the Quran the Word of God? But one of the things that I do point out in the aforementioned video is, well, if you're going to talk about the stylistic excellence of the Quran, we have to ask, well, which Quran are we talking about? Is it the Uthmanic text? Is it Ibn Mas'ud who says it should be Beit Dahab, not Beit Zuhruf? Should it be the pal Sana'a Palimpsest that says it should be Anar rather than Jahannam? Uh, once you point to those variants, it becomes very difficult to say uh, that the Quran is stylistically excellent because apparently... Uh, either you have multiple equally stylistically excellent uh, variants or you have um, a number of variants, only one of which can be stylistically excellent, and we have to figure out which one it is. Now, all of this uh, is contained in my paper, which you can find in my um, academia.edu page. Uh, some of the stuff I presented here is actually not on the paper, so if you listen uh, up to this point, you received some bonus material, uh, but I do recommend looking up the paper for a more detailed explanation of the materials I just mentioned. Thank and, you all. For oh, uh, oh, yeah. I just wanted to point out that that uh, that the link is in the description box for uh, for that. So, um, so yeah, there's a link to that and a link to a collection of videos from um, you and your partner on. Uh, reason and theology dealing with topics on Islam. Um, I do want to wrap up pretty quick because I want to, we're almost at two hours and it's cool if I keep this under two hours. But uh, uh, quick, quick follow up. So earlier I asked you um, how many people are defending perfect preservation of the Quran, miraculous dot for dot, no variance anywhere uh, at the scholarly level. And uh, apparently, apparently, <laughs> Apparently not a uh, not a well represented position at the scholarly level, but uh, one follow up I wanted to ask was the thing that we're hearing now now that now that Muslim da'is are acknowledging that there are variants in the Quran. So it's basically for years they were saying perfect preservation right down to the letter. It's a miracle, and uh, sharing this as one of their their dawa arguments. Then people pointed out like Hatun Tash showing up at Speaker's Corner with Qurans, with different words and so on, actually showing them, putting them in front of their faces. These are different Qurans. Then, of course, they said they went back to the same Da'is. How do we explain this? And their Da'is said, ah, it's just different dialects. So then Muslims ran around saying it's all just different dialects. 
Then we started pointing out that, no, you, you can't account for some of these variants by, uh, by appealing to different dialects and so on. And so then they started getting an understanding that there, which previous generations of Muslims understood, but the new generation did not understand uh, that you had these different kiarats and so on. So now they're being told that all of these uh, variant readings of the Quran somehow go back to Muhammad, that Muhammad revealed them in all these different ways. Now, that's actually what Sheikh Yasser Qadi was in most trouble for in his in his famous holes in the narrative interview. He said that, you know, when you become a student of knowledge and you find out about all these variants, there's a tendency to just agree and accept, agree with and accept whatever explanation your teacher gives you. So your teacher will say, ah, this is different. This is just different dialects or yes, it was revealed in all of these ways. And Yasser Qadi pointed out that it's, it's Western critics who then point out, hey, that doesn't actually work. And he, he, he basically agrees with them. He's saying, yeah, we don't question these things. When we get an explanation, we accept the explanation. But it's Western critics who come in there and say, you know, that doesn't work, right? That doesn't work, explaining it like that. And he, that's when he said, you know, all, all I'll say is the standard narrative has holes in it. And his, he, he was pointing out, one, not only that there are all kinds of variants in the, you know, in the manuscripts of the Quran, but two, that these standard explanations for why you have these, ah, uh, you know, we'll talk about the Ahruf and the Kirat and so on, that they may not actually work. And he's concerned that they don't actually work. So what I wanted to ask you, Lewis, is uh, do you think, do you think that the best explanation of all of these variants is that they somehow all go back to Muhammad. Muhammad revealed them in all these different ways, and now we, we sort of have remnants of them. Or would you explain these differences in some other way? Yeah, I think that the most parsimonious explanation is this all the result of human error. Uh, the idea that all this go all the way back to Muhammad wasn't even the consensus among Muslims themselves until after Ibn Mujahid. Uh, I would agree with people like Atabari, etc., who would say, yes, the reason why people read these things differently is because uh, at some point along the way, people miscopied a manuscript or people mispronounced a word or because, you know, someone thought that a certain synonym uh, made better sense than the word that they found. So again, very human explanations for why these variants uh, exist. I don't think that um, Muhammad told one group of people to say Beit Zuhruf and another group of people say Beit Dahab. Uh, that's a later explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so the the issue is, uh, I wouldn't even regard it as a as a problem for claiming mm -hmm. that the Quran has been well preserved. If a Muslim says the Quran's been well preserved, but there are all these issues, I actually wouldn't have a problem with it because and. and mm -hmm. Any book that's any big book that's copied for long periods of times by humans, you're going to run into pretty yeah. similar things. Um, it's just interesting in Islam. One, they they deny it. They try yeah. to cover it. They try to cover it up by like burning manuscripts or sinking them yeah. in the Nile and so on. Or the, or they come up with the absurd claim that they all go back to Muhammad and Muhammad right. revealed it in all these ways. And just a really serious, I mean, really silly. Whereas if you just said, okay, we got our book, we got our revelations and yes, human beings copying this stuff are going to make mistakes. I wouldn't have a problem. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I would be, I would uh, do one better for Muslim apologists. I would even go so far as to say well, that most of these variations that we see in the manuscripts aren't even as big as the variations we see in biblical manuscripts. We don't have anything uh, comparable to the longer ending of Mark or the woman caught in adultery in the Quran. So at that level, I can even concede that the variations uh, that the Quran has are minuscule compared to the variations in the Old and New Testaments. It's the fact that they make a big deal out of variation that I feel the need to mention. Uh, what for a biblical scholar might seem like minutia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, although if you take, uh, if you take uh, some of the passages seriously that Ubay actually had extra chapters or that Ibn Masud mm -hmm. had fewer chapters, then you could get to some significant... Uh, significant right. variance, but we'll have to say that for uh, for a different day. 
Um, all right. Wanted to thank Lewis for joining in. Again, we have some links in, in the description box. We got links to other videos on some other topics and other discussions, as well as a link to his paper that he's been going through now. If you want a uh, if you want a hard copy to look through, or if you want the actual references that you can have uh, in your hand, that's all there. And uh, Lewis, uh, like to have you back sometime to talk about to talk about uh, the early Quran, uh, early Muslim views on the history of the Quran. Um, yes. I mean, not, not on, on the early Muslim views on what the Quran says about the Bible, because as mm. is so often the case, things that Muslims believe today are often very different from what the early Muslim community thought. So hope to have you back yes. soon. Lord willing. And we'll catch you all later. And by the way, everyone, I will be live again in one hour. We'll be talking about Ali Dawa, his new argument after acknowledging that the scientific argument for scientific miracles in the Quran has been debunked. Now he's saying he's got a new and more powerful case for Islam. So we're going to look at Ali Dawa's new case for Islam. Hope to catch you all then.